welcome back. You're watching Changing India, where we're exploring India's journey into the final frontier with a special focus on India's space program. During the Cold War, in an effort to outgun each other, the US and USSR looked to outer space for military purposes. Over the years, with the development of precision weapons, satellites have become extremely crucial for modern-day warfare. But what is India's stance in space militarization and weaponization? My colleague Manoj Keval Ramani finds out in this next report. At the height of the Cold War in the early 1980s, with two nuclear-armed superpowers threatening mutually assured destruction, US President Ronald Reagan made a startling announcement. What if free people could live secure in the knowledge that their security did not rest upon the threat of instant US retaliation to deter a Soviet attack, that we could intercept and destroy strategic ballistic missiles before they reached our own soil or that of our allies? The Strategic Defense Initiative, or Star Wars as it came to be known, was the first public acknowledgement that space was now a frontier for war. Tacky animations aside, from the first Gulf War onward, militaries around the world have increasingly relied on space assets for warfare. Today, militaries around the world have been using uh, space assets for a variety of military applications. So, and I think, uh, for instance, what we call the passive military applications, whether it's intelligence gathering, surveillance, and so on and so forth. And uh, therefore, uh, this is a term that even India has come to uh, terms with because we also begin to uh, rely or depend on in outer space assets for a number of our applications, military applications. So, th that's something that has already happened. In the first few decades post-independence, India's position was that space was a common good, meant for peaceful use. In every international fora, India vehemently opposed militarization and weaponization of space. The two concepts are quite distinct. While militarization means the use of space technology such as navigation, surveillance and communication to assist military operations, weaponization refers to placing weapons in outer space or targeting space assets with weapons launched from Earth. Over time, despite the official rhetoric changing little, given the new threats of missiles and terrorism in India's neighborhood, the country's position has evolved. Along with that, the Chinese anti-satellite missile test in 2007 was an important turning point. Towards the 1990s onwards, late 90, um, somewhere mid to late 90s, we began to change our approach somewhat in a sense. And I think that was the in recognition of the growing missile threats both in our, in our neighborhood, uh, both short and uh, medium range missiles started appearing, particularly the proliferation between China and Pakistan was gaining a lot more traction and that really began to pose as a clear imperative, security imperative for India to reconsider its positions. So there were a couple of interesting both pragmatic as well as security related uh, factors that pushed us uh, in this regard to change our approach towards uh, to uh, outer space and larger security issues. And clearly the 2007 anti-satellite test conducted by China was a wake-up call for India because till then we were very, uh, we were used to the idea that this is a, this is a domain that is mainly dominated by you know the big powers, the US, the Russians and maybe um, uh, the EU, EU and so on and so forth. But China we never saw it as a big competitor and we didn't see them you know going to and do such an anti-satellite test and so on and so forth to kind of uh, further comp uh, build about uh, building this competition and possible race in uh, outer space. In 2013, India launched its first dedicated military satellite for the Indian Navy for maritime communications. Experts say similar assets for the Air Force and Army are also in the works. But what's really needed is doctrinal clarity and an institutional setup that follows from that. There has been a constant demand from the armed forces also to have a space command. I think until and unless you, these structures will not be put in place, uh, much more progress from the military point of view would not be made. But having said that, I can say that already we have launched GSAT-7, a satellite called Rukmini for Indian Navy. Then there has been a strategic satellite called GSAT-6 also. So there is a, some beginning as far as uh, understanding the requirements of the military because if we are purchasing modern day aircrafts, we are thinking of having state of art technology, then you require a matching infrastructure out into the space. So from that perspective, I think there is a crying need for a separate military space commission and a space command for the armed forces. Another key aspect of a clear space security policy 
will be the structured use of Indian space expertise as a diplomatic tool. This is something that countries like China are already doing. In India, the first step in this direction was taken in 2015 with the inclusion of the Foreign Secretary in the Space Commission. Experts say this is a good beginning. What's needed now is to articulate a clear space policy which sends a signal to the world that India is looking at space as much more than merely a scientific domain. In New Delhi, Manoj Keval Ramani, we on. From the military domain, we now shift focus to the private industry. Although ISRO is a government agency, it outsources a large number of its operations to several private companies. Slowly but surely, the private sector is emerging as a key player in the space domain. One such startup is Bengaluru based Team Indus that is making strides in robotic space exploration. Here's a report. The Team Indus office, located in Bengaluru, has a quiet appearance from the outside. But once you step inside, frantically working engineers, complex-looking prototypes and the very atmosphere here will leave you in awe. The private space engineering organization was founded by IIT and Rahul Narayan in 2010 with a keen eye on the Google Lunar X Prize competition. Today, seven years later, Team Indus has over 100 engineers working to possibly become the first private agency to go on the moon. India obviously has a has a you know a, a, a legacy of having built systems, having built technologies without much of external support, and and we were able to draw on that to be able to find the people, to be able to find the partners who have, have who have helped us along our way. And have, that's how we managed to put together our first prototype. We've done multiple smaller prototypes subsequently. We're doing one uh, early next month. And then there is another one coming out in July, August, which will fly to the moon. It has not been an easy journey for Team Indus, but they have achieved some pretty amazing milestones, quite literally. In 2015, the team won a $1 million prize money from Google for displaying the best landing using the aluminium honeycomb technology. The milestone made the country sit up and take note of the only Indian entrant in the Google competition seriously. Today, they have multiple investors who are helping them work on the mission to design and land a robot on the moon successfully. Some of the big names investing in Team Indus include Ratan Tata and Nandan Nilekani. Building uh, and uh, landing a spacecraft on the moon is the primary goal uh, of Team Indus. We are also, you know, building technology that would help us uh, work on other projects related to the aerospace domain. Uh, however, for now, the core focus is, uh, you know, uh, building and landing the spacecraft. The team of Team Indus is a healthy mix of young enthusiasm and experienced maturity. Close to 80% of the staff here average around 26 years and the rest two dozen are retired ISRO scientists. The teams are formed in a way that the experienced scientists act as mentors to the young minds. In January this year, Google Lunar X Prize Foundation announced Team Indus's place in the final five teams. The mission to the moon is planned as a launch, coast, burn, direct lunar descent trajectory. They plan to launch the rovers by polar satellite launch vehicle operated by ISRO. The proposal for the same has already been made. The planned mission duration is around 30 days and the mass at launch is approximated at 900 kgs. There are two components. One is mission plan, which goes mostly in paper, thought process, and uh, sh make, making the entire plan on the table and viability, feasibility, that is fully ready. The software to be used has been procured, then the data processing software also is ready. So mission-wise, we know all the things are ready, but the service providers, we have to choose between ESA, NASA, ISRO, some combination which uh, is dependent on availability, viability, all those things. They are doing, I feel, this is my view, d d not doing a routine thing. Every day there is a challenge and there is a learning curve. They are not meeting some uh, specific routine mundane targets. They are very happy and we are also happy to work with these youngsters. 
Former chairman of ISRO Dr. Kasturi Rangan has also been regularly mentoring the team in their ambitious mission, thereby enabling them to use the intellectual capital built in ISRO over the years. Team Indus is now keenly working towards the launch of the spacecraft in December this year. They are now working on the qualification model and preparing for the thorough checks that will be carried out in order to make the spacecraft fly ready. In Bengaluru, Nishita Virendra, Vion. And finally, we turn towards the future. In 1969, when NASA astronauts walked the lunar surface, it inspired a generation of young space scientists and researchers. Likewise, the recent successes of the Indian space program are inspiring several young minds in the country to reach for the stars. My colleague Shubhankar Basu tells us more. From launching its first satellite Aryabhat in 1975 to the Mars orbiter Mangalyaan in 2014, the Indian space program has come a long way. It is such successes that have led to a growing interest in the heavens above, particularly among young students. However, leveraging that interest among the youth requires a rethinking of how astronomy is taught. Unimaginative textbook learning often ends up being uninspiring and fails to pique the curiosity of students. That's where agencies like Space India are increasingly stepping in. Initially, people did not understand that astronomy was an important part of their school curriculum. But slowly, uh, the students picked it up. It's a fascinating subject. Everybody loves it. Uh, the students of class 8th, 9th and 10th are discovering asteroids with us. Something that used to fetch you a PhD at some point of time, now a student of class 6th, 7th, 8th is doing it. The more important thing what is happening, there is a lot of collaboration of exchange of data and there is a lot of participation of students in doing scientific analysis. And obviously whenever you are teaching science to students and when they are actively participating in science, they, that broadens their horizon and obviously they develop a lot of scientific temperament and analyze life from a different perspective. In 2008, Amanjot Singh and Sahil Vadva, then school students in Delhi, created history of sorts by discovering the main belt asteroid named 2010PO24. The asteroid was subsequently named after them. I was very average student all the time, even uh, till my bachelor's. I was very, very average student. Um, I never knew what I want to do in my life. Uh, there was no passion as such that I was like, I want to do this thing. But in 6th standard one space introduced astronomy club and that I joined astronomy club. I actually understood astronomy is my passion. So, what I'm, uh, what, whatever I'm doing right now, it's, it's astronomy only, like aerospace astronomy, so it's like all the space parts. Students like Singh and Vadva inspire countless others in India who are in pursuit of greater understanding of the cosmos. For a nation that is rapidly emerging as a global player in outer space domain, the best way to ensure a bright future is to ignite young minds to aim for the stars and do so by engaging the youth in practical science education. In New Delhi, with Achit Suna, Shubhankar Basu, Vion. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of Changing India. Do check out our website, vionnews.com, for all these stories and much more. You can also follow us on various social media platforms. As always, news and updates will continue on Vion. Stay tuned.